All right, all right, all right. You can make it back to your seats. The, the, the song, the song is called Up, Up, Up by Anthony Brown, if you didn't know. He had some requests. Up, up, up. How is everyone doing this beautiful evening? Good, good, good. All right, uh, we got one more, a couple more preliminaries before we get into it. Um, does anybody know who Ric Flair is? I know the Ric Flair? All right. So it's Pastor Appreciation Month, so when I call out their names, I need two claps and a Ric Flair. We have to give honor where honor is due to Pastor Matt and Pastor, I'm sorry, Pastor Monty and Pastor Olga. Give me two claps and a Ric Flair. Woo! All right, all right, all right. That's not the rest of our pastoral team. We got Pastor Matt and Pastor Alicia. Two claps and a Ric Flair. Woo! All right, all right. The last one, but not least, we love them so much. Pastor Chris, and wait, where's your wife? And Pastor Sam, she's, hey, she's here in spirit. She's here in spirit too. But Pastor Chris, Pastor Sam, two claps and a Ric Flair. Woo! All right, all right, let's get into the word. So <laughs> we're going to be starting off in Mark 14. Joseph gave a powerful, powerful word and I told Joseph after, after he finished preaching his word, I felt like I was sitting right next to him as I was writing my, my uh, as I was preparing for this because everything he said was on my page. And I was like, God, do I really have to go up there? Because I already heard it. But he was like, yeah, be obedient. I was like, all right, okay, cool. So Mark 14 says, then he came and found them sleeping and said to Peter, Simon, are you sleeping? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. You may be seated. Now, I know every time, Jay, can you turn this down a little bit? I feel like it's hot. I know a lot of the times when preachers come out of this context, it's very convicting. They're trying to come for you and, and things like that. And... I'm sorry to tell you today, this is kind of one of those times as well. Because um, the Lord was hitting me on this. He was like, nah, it's, it's time for you to mature and it's time for you to move past your silly, your childish responses that you act out of your flesh. So I was like, okay, cool. It's time to grow up. Cool. I can't be a kid with my kid, but it's all right. So the title for today is, What Are You Overflowing? As Jesus was telling Simon, they were preparing for this this moment, he was telling them, like, I need you to sit here and pray. I need you to, to be on watch because I know what's coming. Don't worry about what's coming. Just be obedient to, to what I'm telling you. So he's telling them, he's like, just watch here and pray as I go away and pray right next to y'all. So I need y'all to watch. And this is very interesting because Jesus will always give you instruction before you walk into something with responsibility. Before you ever walk into responsibility, before he ever has you take a step. I just want to correct that. For, for a moment, this, this cultural Christianity that's talking about, like, faith, like, faith is uh, the substance of things not seen, um, but the things heard. I, I'm sorry, I botched that completely. It's in there, Hebrews 11 and 1. But the culture of Christianity is talking about, like, this, this blind faith. Like, just take a step and God's going to take it. Like, you know, just, just walk wherever and you're just going to end up in your, in your calling. You're just going to end up where you need to be. But it, that's not the truth. Don't believe that. Blind faith is, there's no such thing as blind faith. That's ignorance. That's stupidity. That's following really the enemy because there's a clear and concise path that Jesus has for us. So the bulk of this we're going to be in John 18, but I got to give some, some context. I have to give some context before we get there. And it's going to start all the way in John 13. Everybody knows the story. Very familiar. It starts off with the Passover. And it's the dinner, the last supper, right before they go, ah, sorry, right before Jesus goes and sacrifices himself on the, uh, on the cross. So John 13, you know, they come together. He has his 12. They're doing the last supper. And one of the things that he tells him, he says, Peter says to him, you shall never wash my feet. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet, but also my hands and my head. And throughout this, we're going to be looking at a contrast between 
how Jesus responds and how Peter reacts. Peter is a very vital character in the story of Jesus and also after when he gets to Acts and all the writings and things like that. But before he got to be who we know him to be, he was always reacting out of his flesh. He was always wanting to be noticed. He always wanted to be close to Jesus and, and be the best, be the most notarized. And in this moment, after they finish the supper, Jesus puts on his apron and he's teaching them this one thing. He's teaching them humbleness. And there's a few things that he teaches them before they get to the Garden of Gethsemane where their faith will be tested. So he's teaching them humbleness. And he washes their feet. He goes to everyone. And Peter's the last one. He's like, oh, 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 oh God, Jesus, you, you can't wash my feet. Like, that's not what you're supposed to do. I'm supposed to wash your feet. And he was like, if, if I don't wash your feet, you're not a part of me. You, you're not mine. And to give you some context within that, in that time period, they wouldn't even allow Jews, if they were slaves, to wash people's feet because it was the most undefiled, most disgusting thing that was in that time period, like physically. These people walking around in sandals with, with leather, just leather sandals with a strap on it. So they're walking around in dirt roads, and it's getting real nasty. So he's like, Jesus, like, we know who you are. You can't touch this. You're holy. You're separate. You're, you're sanctified. You can't touch this. And he tells him, if I don't wash your feet, you're not a part of me. And he's like, all right, all right, fine, fine, fine. And he has a very religious response. He's like, well, wash my whole body. I know I'm dirty. I know you clean. Well, wash, wash my whole body. I need to be clean. And we're going to jump over to John 14 in verse 8. And it says, Philip says unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it suffices us. And Jesus, in this chapter, he's telling them the promise. He's telling them that he's going to give them the comforter, everything that they need to be able to live out the life when he ascends. He's giving them the promise, and he's building them up, giving them little nuggets, teaching them the little foundation that they will have to stand on and go out as they overflow into all of Judea, Jer Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So he's giving them these little nuggets. And he, says, and he tells them, he says, if you had known me, you should have known my father also. And from henceforth, you know him and have seen him. And Philip was like, all right, Jesus, stop talking to riddles. Show us God. And God's like, are you, are you kidding? Like, I've been walking with you for this, this whole time, and are you you're still confused. You don't understand. When you see God, I mean, when you see me, you see the Father. Jumping over to John 15, everybody knows this story. And after he gives him the promise in John 14, John 15, they get up and they're walking. And he's telling them, he's, I'm the vine. You are the branches. Those who are not a part of me cannot bear good fruit. As they are walking to the Garden of Gethsemane, they're walking through the brook. They're walking through all the weird wilderness. And they're passing this stream. And you just have to imagine Jesus is telling them all these different parables of how he connects to them. John 16, he tells them persecution awaits. Persecution is coming. And I won't be there with you, but I, I already told you I'm sending the comforter. I'm sending someone for you. I'm sending myself so that you can speak boldly on my behalf. You can speak boldly in my name. You can ask anything in my name. And I will give it unto you. You haven't done that before, but now is the time. And lastly, John 17, right before they get to the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus intercedes on their behalf. Because Jesus told them all this stuff. The foundation told, us, told them what's going to happen, what they will need, where they will go, all these different things. And he intercedes because he knows majority of them, if not all of them, don't either remember or didn't believe. So this takes us all the way to John 18. John 18, they finally get to the Garden of Gethsemane. And the reason this is very important is because the Garden of Gethsemane was where Jesus went to pray multiple times. The disciples knew about this place. They were very familiar with it. And as they went to this place, Judas had already left to go betray Jesus. He already sent him on his way, and he's like, be quick. Do what you're going to do. And we get down into John 18, and he says, the people that Judas brought with him were coming to get Jesus. And Peter sees them coming, and he's like, all right, time's coming. I'm about to go and do the do. So as soon as they get there, 
it says, Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. And I want you to hold on to that name a little bit later. But there's two different reactions that we see Peter has. Despite everything that Jesus poured into them, the fact that they need to abide in him, every single wisdom and proverb and parable that he's taught them about being patient, about being loving, about su submitting to his spirit, it goes out of the window. And Peter's standing here. You can just see however many people in their army, and then you see the 12, and Peter's like, all right, I see what's about to go down. I see Jesus. I see them. They got swords. I need to pull out my sword and act. I need to cut off. I just need to act. I just need to do something. I just need to, like, let me just cut off this dude's ear and just start a riot. And maybe we can get Jesus away. And maybe we can protect him if I just get everybody to just act chaos. But, that's, but that was his response. It was out of chaos. It was out of his flesh. And Jesus doesn't want us to act fleshly. That's not the overflow that we are sp supposed to have. That's sometimes the overflow that we, we pour out. And unfortunately, that comes with the fruit of adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, and contentions. And many more, and things alike. But we're not called to overflow the things of our flesh. So when the, the enemy comes to you, whether it's close or far, wherever, and it personally directs it and hits you, like, don't respond. I mean, don't react out of your flesh. Don't get out of the will of Jesus and what he tells you to do. It may be hard. It may be extremely hard. But it's a war. It's a war. We're not trying to win the little battles. As, as many times as I try to win every single battle in my life, I lose. I lose. If I try, if someone tries to come and hurt me physically and I try to get them back, at the end of the day, I'm going to have to stand in front of Jesus on account for what I've done. That's not right. And I told you to hold on to that name, Malchus. And it was very important because he said the servant's name was Malchus. Malchus's name in Greek means king or kingdom. And hold on to that. There's another reaction that Peter has later on in, in verse 26. And he says, one of the servants of the high priest, a relative of him, whose ear Peter cut off and said, did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter then denied again and immediately the rooster crowed. So if you don't know where we are, <laughs> Jesus had already surrendered himself. He's standing on trial in front of Pilate, and Peter's standing at the side trying to warm himself, trying to see what's going on from afar. Now, Peter just had his physical reaction. Now we're in a whole different scenario. Jesus is not standing next to him. He's around a whole bunch of people that he doesn't know, standing by the fire. And the dude that he just assaulted said, didn't I just see you with Jesus? And if, and this is the third time he says no. He's like, no, I, that wasn't him. But that's, that's the overflow of a physical reaction. That is not what Jesus wants us to do. That is not in power. That is not in authority. Because if we're acting out of our flesh, we're going to denounce the name of Jesus. When people come up to us in our job and say, hey, are, are you praying on the job? Are you going to be fearful? Are you going to react because you're scared about your finances being taken away in that one instance? Are you going to respond and be like, no, I, I am praying. I am shining the love and light of Jesus. That is what I'm called to do. That is why Jesus has me here, to share his good news. If someone is trying to dangle something in front of me and manipulate me because of my submission to Jesus, that wasn't for me in the first place. So I can't respond out of my flesh, and I can't be fearful because what Jesus asked me to do. So Peter's standing here, and he's having, having his hands over the fire. And the guy was like, bro, I just saw you in the garden. And Peter's like, no, you didn't. <laughs> that wasn't me. That was somebody else. And, and that was out of fear. But it's very interesting because we judge by the fruit. We've been talking about overflow. It's not a, about flesh and blood, but it's about the spirit. It's about are you submitted to Jesus Christ? Are you submitted to what he has us doing? Are you really willing to allow his kingdom to be established here on this earth? 
And he told them, he's per- persecution is coming. You will be killed. Not y'all, but he was telling them. He's like, you will be killed for this. But to be real, in some parts of the world, people are being killed for this. This is something that we cannot be unashamed for. Because at the end of the day, whether it happens or it doesn't, and we stand on account for what we had to do, if that was in our, in our story, and we're like, Jesus, no, like I couldn't, that was too much for me. Are we really overflowing what he poured into us? Jesus gives us his spirit to live out in boldness, to live empowered. Peter had not yet had his spirit dwelling with inside of him. So all of his reactions were flesh. He wasn't able to, to submit to the spirit. Even though he heard every single word from Jesus, he walked with Jesus. So he didn't need the spirit dwelling in him yet. But it was out of disobedience. It was out of disobedience that he just let everything go in one ear and out of the other because he was in the heat. Because he was standing in the midst of everything that was going on. He was like, I, I just need to act. I don't know what's going on. It's getting hot in here. I just need, to, I just need to, to move. I need to do something. And the walls are getting closer. And it's, it's crushing him in. And he's like, I can't handle this. The fire is too hot. But pressure, pressure makes diamonds. Pressure makes diamonds. So you might be in a situation that's compressing you. And don't be discouraged if you don't have the Holy Spirit. Prophesy like you do. Speak if it's not so like it already is. Jesus tells us to judge the fruit. Either make the tree good and its fruit good or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For the tree is known by its fruit. What kind of fruit are you putting out? Are you reacting or are you responding? Jesus has had me judging the fruit of how I react or respond with my family. Because it's very easy to react with family. You can react and Y'all be cool the next day. But if these are the people that I'm praying for, how can I react and say, Jesus is going to save you. Jesus is going to do this. And they're like, you're talking all that Jesus talk, but you just, you were just acting one way the other day. So how can I trust the words that are coming out of your mouth? How, if I'm really not seeing the change in your life, you're not overflowing what Jesus has supposedly poured into you. How can I really go and trust you and come see that he is really good, that he's really a good, good father? Because, yeah, you might have those days, but I can have those days too. The things that I'm doing, I can easily go do whatever I want to do and still have a good day here and there. And if that's what you're producing, why why do I go try Jesus? And I told you to hold on to that that name Malchus because as Jesus was standing at the trial Jesus answered and Pilate asked him he's like are you a king he's like well you say so and he's like all right well if you're a king why are all these people rioting against you why are these people fighting and trying to get you killed and he's like well Jesus answered my kingdom is not of this world if my kingdom were of this world my servants wouldn't fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews, but my kingdom is not from here. I told you the name Malchus in Greek means king or kingdom. And this whole time, Peter's hearing Jesus, I'm coming to destroy their kingdom and rebuild it in three days. I'm coming to establish a new order. I'm coming to do all, he's coming to reestablish and do all these things that Peter is taking in physically. So he's like, all right, well, this is the moment. He sees the guy whose name means king, and he's like, that's the guy. Let me react and cut his ear off. Let me cut his ear off because he's been talking about reestablishing a kingdom. That must be it. This must be the opportunity. So let me put myself in a place to overflow on what Jesus is saying. He's been saying this the whole time, so this is my moment. Let me step and take, let me take, let me take the mic and do this on my own. Jesus, I know this is what you called me to do. You said I've been great. You pulled me into your close three. I know this is my moment. Let me shine. Let me shine. I know I've been carrying this sword, this sword for a moment. Let me react. But Jesus is like, you know, you got this confused. My kingdom is not of this world. I'm not fighting against flesh and blood. I'm fighting against the spirits and principalities. 
I'm fighting against the things unseen in this world. But how do we fight? How do we fight? First, you have to put on the armor of God, the helmet of salvation salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, the shoes of peace, using the sword, which is his word, and holding up your shield of faith. All these things active, and none of them, even though the sword might be confusing, not confusing, but forgot the D word, but distorting, it's not an offensive weapon. It's for defense. So when the enemy comes, you use that word. You're not going out just looking, oh, I'm a demon killer. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus said, you know, yeah, you cast you out. You out in the name of Jesus. Jesus, not, he's not coming for all that. Jesus is not coming for all that. Jesus, he wants us to respond. And when the world comes against us, when they have when, or what they would think every account to accuse you, you respond in love, in joy, in peace, in long-suffering, in kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And we definitely can't forget about the last one. I often do. I forget about the self-control part. I like to love. Well, I like to say I'm gentle, but that self-control, I, I'll lose it sometimes. Push the right buttons, and, I, and I'll lose the self-control. It's, it's about Sunday to, to Thursday. That Friday to Saturday, we're working on those days. Those are the rest days. <laughs> but overflow, it's not something that we can turn on and off. It's not. It's not something that we can control because if we put a lid on the top of, of this cup, there's nothing coming out. And Jesus, he has no limits. He's an unlimited God. He is full of goodness and joy and peace and long-suffering. And every single moment that we are attacked, every single moment that the enemy tries to come against us, we do not have to respond. I mean, react. We have to respond. We have to be patient. We have to live as Jesus called us to live. And I know that's not the popular thing at all. Because in the moment, it may feel like you're losing. But though they slay me, though they slay me, every moment that we have with someone, we are reflecting what's on the inside of us. Because it's not what goes inside of you that defiles you. It's what comes out of you. What's coming out of you is a fruit coming out of you. It's his love coming out of you. It's his passion coming out of you. It's his boldness coming out of you. Because Jesus is not timid. He didn't give us the spirit of timidity or fear. But of power, love, and a sound mind. Amen. Are we really being bold for Jesus Christ? He's really been hitting me on that going to work. I work on a campus that worships the Catholic idols. And they have given me the room in every meeting, every single morning to pray. Every single morning, I get to open up the day in prayer. And I have to be honest, those last couple of prayers, I was like, Jesus, thank you so much for this morning. Oh, Jesus. And, you know, I just, I just really, we just thank you. You heard all the prayers and supplications. Order our steps and keep us in your will today. In Jesus' name, amen. While authority is not just about being loud and, and boisterous, it's not. But am I going to take authority in those situations where it's uncomfortable? Well, people who are declaring really not the name of Jesus, will I declare the name of Jesus and speak those things and, and prophesy and, and speak boldly and watch Jesus work? Will I overflow that or will I overflow my fear because I'm worried about losing a job, or I'm worried about what they might think, or I'm worried about them not accepting me. Are we here for acceptance? Are we here for, for cools? Are we here for, for clicks? Are we here for, to advance the kingdom? Are we here to advance Jesus' Jesus' will? What are we here to do? And that's what we really have to ask ourselves. Do I really want to pour out 
his fruit? Do I really want to pour out his spirit? Because I can sit over here and jump in the corner on every Sunday with people who have his spirit, who have his commonality, and scream as loud as I can. But as soon as I walk out of those doors, is that really overflow? Or am I reacting? Because Jesus is in this room most, most definitely. But when I step into a situation where Jesus may feel, it may feel like Jesus is not glorified or he may not be glorified, will I be bold? Will I speak about the things that he is telling me to speak? Will I pray for those individuals who need prayer, even though they may not be speaking it and he's telling them? Will I pray for them? Will I step out? Or will I physically react and do what's comfortable for me? Just tell them, oh, Jesus is with you. He loves you. I'll pray for you. He's there and see no change. Even the priests on the campus do that for him. And we see what's been happening. And this is not throwing stones at people, but this is really a heart check. Are we going to allow his spirit to take us in boldness, to mature us, to move us past the part of our comfort zone? That's the real question that we have to ask ourselves. Because though the fights are also not flesh and blood, the war within us is also not flesh and blood. The enemy wants you. He's going to play with your mind. He's going to try to take you away from his word. If we are not in his word every single day and overflowing what comes out of us in this, what are we overflowing? Are we chewing and meditating on his word day and night, night and day? Or are we giving ourselves to other things, to the idols that we lift up in this world? Sports, academia, our job, our family, what we want to pursue. What are we pouring ourselves out to? Jesus didn't come and sacrifice himself. To allow you to live a timid life without boldness. The boldness of Christ only comes when we take a step outside of the boat and trust that he is going before us. Trust that the time that we've spent with him, that he's poured into us. Trusting in him that he actually leads us, that he guides us every single day. When we step into this boldness... That is when we give him room to be able to overflow outside of us, to overflow into our relationships, into our families, into our friends, and into every single situation that we walk into. It's no coincidence that Sunday morning we've had four people, four Sundays in a row, someone's received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. There's no coincidence. That's because of the overflow in this room, because the faith in this room. And we can't stop there. Last week, I was, I was 99% right, but 99% of the people in the room had been baptized in water. The next step is to be baptized with his spirit. We don't just stop there. And once we get baptized with his spirit, then we go out. And we bring others who have not been baptized. And the cycle just keeps going. And it keeps going. And we keep overflowing until this house is full. And Jesus will expand more. And then we fill that next house. And we just keep on moving until we keep keep taking ground. Loyola, Xavier, Dillard. Your job, Oshner. Wherever you go. They need Jesus. They need to come see the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. They need their life to be radically changed because they've been going through the same situations day in and day out. And they're tired of it, but they don't know the answer. And if we have the answer within us, why are we withholding it? That spoils. It spoils. And we really do them a disservice. And we have to stand on account for that. Because I know for a fact that Jesus tells every single person in here who to pour out to. Every single person. 
So are we going to obey his voice and pour out in the areas that he has us in? Regardless if they listen or not. Look at the prophets. He told one of the prophets, he was like, go. Go and, go and tell them, warn them. But they will not listen. You can't judge your obedience off of their other people's responses or their reactions. Just be obedient. Just take the step. Just allow the Lord to pour into you and do what he wants to do. At the end of the day, if they get dunked or not, that's not on you. You, you share the good news. That's all you need to do. Share the good news, share his love, and walk life with him. And when we walk life with him and we overflow what Jesus wants us to overflow, things will happen. Someone will listen. And when they get baptized, they're going to reach others, and it will continue to spread. Truthfully, and I'm going to just be bold with it, there's no reason why we can't have all these seats filled. Not just because we want more people in the room just to say we have a big church and we can count numbers, but because there's a name on every single one of these seats. And every single name is attached to somebody in this room. We all know at least two people who need to know Jesus or who may have walked away from Jesus and have been hurt in a relationship by someone who's been marginalizing them or who's not taught them complete truth. But if you know where you come and you hear truth, you know where you come and the community is surrounding you and it's uplifting you and you're actually seeing change, why would we withhold that from someone else? That's selfish on our, on our part. Don't worry about if they come the first time after you ask them. Keep asking. There was the, the widow who came into the king. She kept asking. She was like, king, I, I need justice. I need justice. I need justice. I need justice. And the king got tired of her asking, so he was like, all right, you got justice. I'm going to handle it. He didn't want to handle it, but because the fervent prayers of the righteous availeth much. The fervent prayers of the righteous avail much. So if we are fervent, if we are truly seeking for those individuals to come in this house, they will be here. Because his word does not return void. His words do not fall on the ground. And I can speak boldly. The words of the pastors in this house have not fallen to the ground because they hear from Jesus. They follow Jesus, and I'm following right behind them. They're making it real easy. <laughs> Trust me, they're making it real easy. But that's the whole point of community. Whether you're here just, or you think you're here just for school, or if you're planted here, you have a purpose. You have a mission, and it's to overflow what Jesus has poured into you. There are people who have been getting baptized in water and spirit. People have been set free. Chains are being broken. Peyton, it's so good to see you in the house, man. So good to see you in the house. And there's many other testimonies in the room. But it, we can't just stop here. We can't stop here. I don't want to stop here. I don't want to see. Y'all are cool. But I don't want to see just us in the house every week. I want to see new faces. I want to meet new people. I want to be able to pour out his spirit to, to multiple people and, and pray for them. That's when it gets fun. It's fun now. Don't get me wrong. It's, it's fun now. I love y'all. Don't get that confused. I love y'all. But I would love for this community just to grow and grow and grow so we can have this house full. Jesus has entrusted us with an opportunity, and yet all of us may not be able to go. But the pastors and a few others get to go to Kenya, and they're about to do a crusade for multiple days. They're about to do a whole bunch of ministry. But that doesn't mean just because we're physically not there that we can't overflow in that situation. And it also doesn't just stop with our prayers. Jesus wants to use us holistically. He wants to use the gifts that, you, that he has given you. He wants to use your mind. Don't check your brain at the door. He wants to use your spirit, the gifts that he's given you spiritually as well. 
But also, don't cringe up when I say this. He wants to use the abundance of money that he has poured into your pocket. Even if that abundance is $13.07. That $13 can do a lot. That $13 can do a, a whole bunch. That can buy a goat in Africa. It, no, I'm not making jokes about Africa. I'm being very serious. Like, this can do something for an entire, it can feed a family. It can, the little things that we think about in our little box of America can change and shift a whole entire family. Think about, think about if you say, Jesus, you're asking me, I made 20 bucks. You're asking me for $2. I can't give it, but I may not. I can, but fine, I'll give it to you. And that gets overflowed into whatever family, not just Africa, because that's also a bad stereotype that Africa is the only people that need, that need help. That's messed up. That's, a, that's an American thing. But around the world, wherever it goes, and Jesus sends that $2 to that family, that could be the difference between somebody saying, Jesus, you are Jehovah Jireh. You are a provider. Though it's just the two mites that you gave me, that's provision. And that helps and extends a time of period and gives and uplifts them. And that way they can go and tell that testimony. Look, Jesus provided for me. Jesus helped me in the situation. We sought him and he responded. Our obedience is attached to somebody, whether we know them personally or we don't know them. Our obedience is attached to them. But if we're overflowing, you know, I'll just get my $1 here and there, 25 cents, when I really make a whole boatload of money. And it's not just about money. It's about our heart posture. And if we call this place home, that means this is our family. And if we know the needs in the house of our family and we withhold them, do we really love them? What are we overflowing? Are we overflowing love? Are we overflowing our selfishness and saying, you got it. You'll get there. I'll pray for you. You'll get there eventually. It's not flesh and blood. I can't stress that enough. The list of things that we try to attack, and I, I really feel like somebody needs to hear this. The list of things that we try to attack physically are probably about that big. But the things that really should be attacked spiritually, way, I can't, I'm sure, I can't reach that high, but way bigger than this room. When we shift our mind to attacking things spiritually, to surrendering them to Jesus first before we even take a step. That might be the difference between you reacting and responding, between you hurting someone and helping them, between you pouring out love or pouring out hate. Are you being separated from Jesus or drawn closer to him? In those little moments, are we trusting Jesus? And that's really the sum of it. It's not flesh and blood. It is not flesh and blood. It's the spirit that Jesus wants. And it's the spirit that the enemy is trying to take away from us. So don't let him drain your spirit. Allow Jesus to pour into your spirit so that you can overflow the goodness. Jesus is leading us into a deeper moment. Not just a deeper moment, a deeper lifestyle, an intimate lifestyle with him. And this is not coming from me, but the pastors have said it starts in this room with the individuals you are sitting next to right now. And we can cheer and yell and do all the right christian these type things. But if we don't take the right steps during the week, we won't see the fullness that he wants us to see. So I ask you,
Is salvation enough? Is salvation truly worth it? It is, if you didn't know the answer. Do you want to live a life in eternity with Jesus? Or do you want to live eternity separated from him? And I know that seems like a very drastic question to ask, but it's the reality that we live in. It's the reality. Do we want others to see his goodness? Do we want to overflow the fruit of the Spirit? Or do we want to hold on to our flesh because it's comfortable, it's easy, and I don't have to mature? Because maturation only comes through the Spirit. I know 70 and 80 year old babies. It's sad, but it's the truth. The spirit is the only thing that can mature you because maturity only comes through the fruit from God. Pettiness, anybody can do that. Complaining, Babies do that all the time. Fighting. See enough of that in New Orleans. But we don't see enough of his spirit pouring out love, peace, kindness, goodness in his vessels. We need more of it. And it only comes through our obedience. So I'm going to just ask everyone to close their eyes. And no one's looking other than the pastors so that they can pray for you. I'm going to ask two simple questions. Raise your hand if you have not been baptized in water. Raise your hand if you have not been baptized in the Spirit. being judged and there's also no lack if you have answered yes to either or both of those questions but this is a community that believes in the power of God we believe that Jesus will respond when we call on his name. So Jesus, you see the prayers and supplications. You see the individuals who want to go in deeper relationship. You see the needs. You see where we are in our current situation. Jesus, you see the circumstances that we live in day to day. And we do not want to highlight those. But we want to glorify and magnify your name. 
We want to lift you up. But Jesus, you know, and you made the promise that you would send a comforter. A comforter that will empower us. To go out and preach your good news with boldness and doing greater works than you did. That's what you said, Jesus. And Jesus, you also say where two or three are gathered, you are in the midst. So Jesus, do what you have already been doing. Pour your spirit out, God. It's not a question of whether you can. Because we know that you are a covenant-keeping God. We know that you are a man that cannot lie. We know that this promise is for our children and our children's children. And as many as the Lord shall call. And you have called us all into this room tonight. So Jesus, just as the prophet said, if you hear my prayers, make it rain. Make it rain on this carpet. Jesus, I step in that same boldness and say, pour your spirit out on those who are waiting to receive your spirit, waiting to receive the gift that you have for them. We want to receive everything that you have for us, Jesus. We want to mature in your spirit. We want to overflow your fruit. But we need, we need your spirit. We need you to guide and lead us every single day. We need to be connected to the vine. As you order our steps through the persecution, through the hurt, through the past trauma, as you are leading us out and past these things. Jesus, we need you to empower us because we cannot do it alone. It is not flesh and blood and my strength is not enough. My words are not enough. Pour your spirit out, Jesus. Pour your spirit out, God.